Okay then, a result there clearly, and even Mark Cowie admitted it, thrown the cat among the pigeons in the Highland League title race. It has, a wee bit, ah oh, yeah. It's a mega cat, what are you talking about? <laughs> <laughs> I think Mark summed it up quite well in terms of, you wouldn't say it definitely opens the door for Fraserburgh yet, but they're not out of it either. I mean, oh, they're three points behind Brechin with three games left for both of them. Brechin seven in front on goal difference just now, but with the Broch, I mean, you look at the, their last three games and with all due respect, playing Strasbourg home and away, if Fraserburgh do need goals, there is an opportunity there where you think they maybe could could get goals, so it keeps it very interesting, puts a little bit more pressure on Brechin again in terms of their three games, Keith away on Wednesday, Forrest at home Saturday, Brora away Nick the following Saturday, if they go and win them in all light, unless we'll come on to Bucky probably later, but unless Bucky win all their games and rack up the goals, in all likelihood if Brechin win their three games they'll win the league, but if, if they were to suffer a defeat somewhere along the road Fraserburgh potentially now in a, a position to pounce the new to have a chance they had to win on Saturday and they did that I mean with Bucky being off kind of complicates things further they've got six league games in 13 days um, but they're now nine points behind Brechin with the three games in hand they're 14 behind on goal difference but it's a, again they play Strasbourg home and away which Again, you think potentially if they need goals, they could go after them, and we saw on Saturday, which we'll come on to later, but Strathspey struggled, so conceding seven against Turriff, so it's really, really interesting now how it's set up, and a lot of pressure on all the sides in the remaining games, and it could be a scenario which I hope transpires, where we get to the last day of the season, and you could have three clubs all in with a chance of winning the league. Fraserburgh at home at Strathspey, Brechin are at Brora, Bucky are at home at Keith, I believe. That would, if all three were still in with a chance in the last day, it would be an incredible finish to the season. You still, the, the other two managers would still want to be in Garvin Price's shoes, Aye. though. At this point, that's, that's, that's the crucial bit, and he, I'm sure that's a message he'll be giving his players. But I'm, we're going to talk about the, the actual game in a minute. But they're still in the driving seat. It's yep. theirs to, to lose at this point and if, if you'd offered breaking that if you'd offered any of those managers that scenario three games to go you know you win your three games you're champions I think they all would have taken it we were talking about cats and pigeons earlier <laughs> it's clearly a difficult day to be a pigeon or a seagull <laughs> or a goalkeeper um, it, it was it was on all the games across Scotland were <laughs> more or less affected by the wind on Saturday obviously You've got to kind of use it to your advantage when in the half where you, you've got it. There were penalties in the game as well. Well, with the conditions, I mean, it's like Fraser, I think, would rather, Ken, would have rather played in a still day as well. But I think the advantage Fraser have, although some of their players even argued with me about this when I claimed <laughs> it was an advantage after the game. It's always but, <laughs> but they are, the wind and particularly the way it often comes at Bells Lee where it blows down the hill as well, they are more used to playing in that because it's their home ground than the visitors. So I think that does, can be a wee advantage and Brechin won the toss and turned him round and Fraser had the conditions in the first half and as Mark said as well in his interview, they had to, to, they had to take advan advantage of that and get themselves something to hold on to in the second half and they did and I mean I think on another day they could have scored more than they did. Lenny Wilson's had three or four really good saves and they've had scrambles at corners and even the one that drops to the corner that Greg Buchan puts over on another day probably scores. I think, you know, on another day, Fraserburgh could have been further in front and then second half, uh, Gavin Price touching it and I would agree, Brechin weren't able to put Fraserburgh under as much pressure as Fraser put them, and what I would say with that is, yeah, Brechin had uh, plenty of territory as you'd expect in the through balls into the box, but in terms of chances, they didn't have as many as the Brock had in the first half. They were like, they scored, Danny Handling scored, and then Matthew Wright has that one a couple of minutes after, 
which on another day he scores and at 3-3 momentum's probably is all with Brechin and it's maybe a different story but other than that and then the, the penalty like Brechin didn't create a huge amount I mean they could have pro been better in that regard but I do think you give the Brock up you need to give the Brock credit it was a I thought there was other players had great games but I thought Kieran Simpson take away two penalties he scored I thought in terms of defensive performance he was absolutely outstanding in the first half any time they played a long ball forward breaking he was coming and winning it and with the wind his headers was going 30 yards and putting breaking instantly under pressure and then the second half really anything that came into the box in his area he was going and winning and dealing with and he's also despite being a young player he's also such a good organizer and communicator which in conditions like that when you're facing a lot of long throw-ins corners free kicks things like that makes a big difference as well in terms of the penalties three of them in the game what we're saying uh, well, I'll after, tell you what after, I'm saying. Uh, well after the game <laughs> Gavin Price was very unhappy with the penalty given against Brecon however I would argue that the penalty Brecon also yeah. got shouldn't have been a penalty either so that's I'm with you. Two out of three, three for me. Yeah. Shouldn't two have been three well, are not penalties for me. The, the first, first and the third. The first one is the key one. In, in terms of, like, you see it in the footage, and there was also our photographer at the game was perfectly positioned, had a great photo. Lewis Martin clearly gets a touch on the ball when he slides across so Aidan Sapel. And then I think it's that sort of sandwich effect where you, like, you and Sparks come in from the other side and they've sort of sandwiched Sapel and he's going down. And I think that's sway the referees. I think I, that's I can Lewis, Lewis that. Brown. I think has seen it where he maybe potentially because of the angle he's got doesn't see the ball move, and he sees two players come in for either side of Sapel and down he goes. But it's one of them where personally I don't think it's a penalty, and if it hadn't been given, I don't think you'd have had a huge amount of appeals from home supporter saying it was a penalty because the ball moved but I can it's one of them I can, the view Lewis Brown's got I can maybe understand it but I don't think, think it was a penalty where the second Brock penalty was a stick on penalty and even sitting in the stand it was at the perfect angle Willie West was tripped what was interesting with that is Seth Patrick had already been booked by that point and he could have been booked again and I thought it was telling as well that pretty soon afterwards he was uh, taken off before he was probably sent off so that was maybe if you talk about decisions that was maybe one where he could have potentially gone the breaking penalty I can understand why that's given as a penalty I think Fraser McLeod anticipates that there's a challenge and is probably keen to ensure there's contact but that's that, hap that happens in the game it's that's it's good. That's, yeah. that's part of that and I thought what was interesting with that although you, you guys feel it's dubious out of the Fraserburgh players Willie West was the only one who sort of appealed the rest of them you know you saw like the first penalty the breaking players were around the referee but with that one it was only really Willie himself who was kind of trying to claim it was not a penalty. A disappointing thing for me with the last one is the assistant referee is on that side, isn't he? I mean, they mm -hmm. must have the best view of anyone as to whether there was there was actual contact. Because I've looked at back at it a few times because I, I had to do the, the commentary for it. And to me, I, I couldn't see a touch at all. But. What, what I would say, and this is where I'll probably disagree, disagree with Gavin Price, is I don't think the decisions have impact like have affected the overall result like in my opinion the better team in the day won the game and even if the first penalty wasn't given I still think that Fraser would have been going in at half time in front because of the way they played in that first half I can understand why Brechin are annoyed and clearly losing that mm -hmm. first penalty sets you back but I I personally don't think that had as big a bearing on the outcome as some people might Yeah, perhaps also a bit of siege mentality going on at this stage <laughs> in the season when the results are needed ok then a Banks of D win in the end we'll come, to the <laughs> we'll come to the end of the game later on but I think it's clear that Huntley should have been ahead or would have, would have hoped to have been ahead in that game with the chances they created 
Daniel Hoban denied them on a few occasions. They were, they were made to pay for it, weren't they? It's a wild. How many chances do you need to win a game of football? Huntley must be pig sick at coming away with nothing from that game because the chances I had when it was nil nil were ridiculous. They should have been well in front and then they fall behind. I do think, in fairness to Banks, I think after the, I mean, there's the two great saves was for. Angus Grant and Ryan Sewell but Manx had after that were hitting the post and a couple other things they kind of like I thought both both teams created quite quite a lot in that and it was quite a decent watch overall I think Josh went and touching it in his post-match quotes that Banks had without being at their best it was a good win and I mean keeps him sitting third just now and with two games to go albeit Brora away and Wick away if they were to win those uh Games that finish with seventy four points, which excellent would be an excellent season overall for them. Thought the opening goal for Banks D reflected what's quite an exciting little partnership between Hamish McLeod and Chris Hunt and Yatsi. I think they had that was three three times in a row they linked up quite nicely in the game. They're tidy. They're a, a, a tidy tandem, shall we say? Um, they're they're very good. They're, you've got a creator and you've got a finisher there, and uh, that's a perfect example for it. Is that is that first goal? But I, I still feel like I'm coming back to Huntley yeah. though. It's like we, we've talked all season about the top six, and if you want to break in there at the head to heads, I took that game if for me in a nutshell is what the, the, that small margin is what you need to overcome to be a, a difference maker and force your way into that top six. We filmed two games at the weekend, of course, five penalties in them, um, two in this game, one the Bucks day, of course, through Gary Wood, but then Huntley get a penalty in the set. Uh, it was the first half End to, of the first to make half. it 1-1. I've got to be honest, I didn't think Banksy's Darren Kelly done a lot uh, done a lot wrong. I think uh, was it no, fin- Finlay well, Allen? Fin- Finlay Allen does well and he's probably running down a bit of a cul-de-sac and wants the contact and sort of forces himself into Darren Kelly even then, was it enough to, enough to send you down? He might say yes, but it's it's one of them where per, you're on a bit of linesman. That's where the, no, it was that's, me. It was me. No, sorry. Fair. That's where the li- that. that's where the <laughs> linesman on that side I think has to help the referee Kevin Murray out because he should have a view, which probably tells him that's not a penalty. Because Darren Kelly, there's no trip or anything. Like I'm not really sure there's much else Darren Kelly could have done and it's one of them obviously Huntley'd been d- delighted to get it and from their point of view they'll say Finlay Allen's done well to get that penalty and he did but I think regardless of who you support NMD watching that if that penalty was given against your team you'd be unhappy and I don't think don't think it should have been a penalty I think the second one that Banks had he got was a penalty I mean got uh, Snake Gary Wood, Hamish McLeod yeah. has done well to get away for Lewis Crosby and I can see what he's trying to do just get the ball out for a corner but he's sort of come through Hamish McLeod so n- no issue with that one uh, Andy Hunter with obviously was on the losing side but should be noted that his penalty goal Gary Wood obviously scored two goals in the game but Andy Hunter's goal for Huntley was his 24th goal this season we've talked about him many times this season already but just, just keeps banging them in it was a really impressive tally Aye, very much so. I mean, you probably have to go back quite a few years for us, especially in, given the way th- things have been in recent times for them. You have to go back quite a few years to have a, a Huntley player scoring 24 goals in a, a season. You're probably going back more to the the golden years of players like Richie Taylor, Martin Stewart, those sort of guys. So great, uh, you know, great record for Andy Hunter, but I'm sure coming away with nothing on Saturday would he wouldn't be thinking too much about his individual tally. Okay, let's get to it then. Three <laughs> sending up, sending offs at the end of the game. Ross Still for Huntley, Alistair Stark, Daniel Hoban for Banks D. Um, we also understand that Ross Still was hit with a second violent conduct charge after the game as well, or because of the, inc- the incident as in the way it unfolded. Um, now, what we can see for definite is Ross still comes in slightly late on Daniel Hoban. I don't think it looks no. overly bad. Ali Stark and Ross still are then sort of like 
wrestling with each other in the in the goal. Hoban then comes back in and he's wrestling Ross still. Is it three red cards? Is it, is, is it worthy of that? Or was it just... I, I've seen people on social media well, saying three bookings would have sufficed from the game. Potentially. I mean, we don't see fully what goes on afterwards. What's interesting, and I don't think I would have clarity on this, is is Ross Stills' red card, is that for a second booking for the foul or is that a straight red card for what goes on in the net? Because if he's been hit with a second red for violent conduct, that would suggest... Sent off the foul. He's been sent yeah. off for the foul, which I can maybe understand, but I think, I still think it's not. Like, there seemed to clearly be, and maybe the penalty Huntley had, had added to that, but there seemed to clearly be an edge to the game and a bit of needle between the teams because you look at that incident and does Ross still need to catch Daniel Hoban? Potentially no, but it's a foul and not like. You see those sort of fouls and goalkeepers all the time and nothing mm-hmm. happens. And like Daniel Hoban g- got the contact, but it wasn't, uh, like it wasn't particularly dangerous play or anything like that. And I mean, he was down, but then when it kicked off, he was back up v- very quickly to join in. And what I'd odd about it as well is like Ali Stark's reaction. I, I mean, I can understand it a wee bit and can passions boil over and things, but probably su- sums up the edge for me a wee bit is Ali Stark isn't a player you'd ever have at the top of, <laughs> top of a list for getting involved in that sort of thing and being sent off for violent conduct so I just thought it was quite an odd incident all round and I mean yeah. I don't think I personally didn't think the initial foul was bad enough that it, all yeah. that needed to happen but clearly it has and it's one one of those things, and the referees dealt with it as he saw fit. But you kind of wonder, did the referee and the linesman <laughs> see yeah, everything that went on in the net as like well? I was going to say, at the risk of it evoking Shakespeare here, it was much ado about nothing for yeah. me. I mean, obviously, may- maybe there's something we don't see that goes on. But, I mean, we did get the silver lining of the best sight in football, which is the outfield player pulling on the gloves, pulling on the goal <laughs> shirt, despite it being for a short period of time. What I would say with that as well is with the corner at the end, fair play to Max Alexander, he was quite commanding Aye. there, he was pushing boys out of the way and stuff. Although if that, if that went in, then you would have been accused of you know, getting too caught up in the <laughs> stuff. But anyway, let's move on to the other three games that actually took place at the weekend. The first one we'll start with, um, for reasons we'll come to, Tariff United 7, Strathspey Thistle 1. Hat-trick from Ewan Clark in this one, who would go on later in the evening to be named Players Player of the Year at Tariff United. There's also a John Allen double, Jack McKenzie and Reese McEwen got a goal, a goal each. You and Neil scored Strathspey's goal, although Strathspey's Strath Strath Twitter said Owen Loveland, so... It's one of them. Get in touch via the email address. <laughs> We'd like to see it so we could confirm. We could make it the question for next week. Who scored? I think we probably will get a ton of footage later in the day, so it's probably on the screen right now, um, or slightly earlier. Um, but the big news after this one was, I mean, the unexpected revelation that somebody we've talked about has been one of the best keepers in the Highland League, David Day, age just 26, Tariff's keeper, he's going to have to retire at the end of the season for health reasons. Pretty. Yeah, I mean, you spoke to David. I have. Yes, um, this one. Yeah, he's um, been suffering and had confirmation that it's um, arthritis is affecting his hips and his fingers, which for a goalkeeper are yeah. probably the two areas that <laughs> you need most. Um, it's a real shame. He's, he's been terrific. And he made the point he's still kind of taking it all in at this point. Not quite sure what the future holds, whether this is him completely finished in football or whether he'll continue in a different capacity. Um, I think that'll probably hit home for him when it comes to the summer and pre-seasons underway and he's he's not involved. But yeah, it's a, it's a huge shame for him. He's, he's a very good uh, player and as the club have said themselves in their their statement they put out confirming his um, retirement. He's more than just that, he's almost doubles his social yeah. convener in the life and soul of the dressing room, I think. It's a huge blow for Turriff because, I mean, they're mainly comprised of young players and I, th- I think if you read the quotes from the weekend, from Saturday before this was announced, it, they're, t- they're talking about this summer getting a couple more experienced heads in just to continue that mm-hmm. upward trajectory they've been on. So to lose somebody like David Day, who's one of their you know, they're most important experienced players at the moment. It's, it's a big blow. It certainly is. I mean, even you go back to 
a couple of seasons ago when they were down near the bottom of the table when they were sort of just starting out on this sort of journey that they've been on. I mean, I kind of a couple of current and former Turriff players that were there that season have said to me in the past that David Day with some of the saves he made that season and points he helped them win was potentially the difference between Turriff finishing bottom and Fort William finishing bottom. That's it, which is, yeah. um, which is quite, you know, obviously the last couple of seasons when they've improved he's still been great, but that's maybe quite telling as well that when things were a struggle, can he was there and you know bailed them out on occasions and I mean he'll be a tough, tough act to follow certainly David. And it's a, I mean it's a shame, Sir Kim, twenty six, no age at all. It's a shame the the circumstances that he, he's having to retire in. Let's move on then to Devonville 2, Inverary Locos 1. Another game which, according to our correspondent that was there, sounded windy. Maybe we should get some kind of measuring devices at all the Highland League grounds to find out what's still the windiest ground of all. Would you say, Belsley? Oh, for me, yes. Uh, a f- I think <laughs> you've. Bells- no, but Belsley, De- Princess Royal, Grant Park Lossy, Victoria Park Bucky. Brora as well would be my Dudgeon Park Brora would be my five in terms of windies, but Wick on its day as well can uh, <laughs> all of them. Aidan really okay, <laughs> uh, <laughs> Wilson had locos ahead in the first half. Sounded like they were potentially quite wasteful locos. Got their manager Dean Donaldson, despite playing well. Um, this led Devonville eventually to turn the game on its head in the second period. Cameron Angus scored the equaliser and then Ryan Park scored the winner really late on in the game I mean for Vale it's perhaps a just reward for a couple of games where they've performed well but haven't really got anything well we say performed well and haven't really got anything they've had four games under Grant Noble they've drawn three of them as in their manager they've drawn three of them and they've won that one they could have probably won three well if they're everything gone for them, could have yeah. won all four, but certainly they'd strong claims to win, win. three yeah. of them because they were in front against Lossy and conceded two late on, and they were in front against Baroda on Wednesday and conceded late on. And I mean, that's a really good result for them. And like, I think Grant Noble and Graham Watt have done very well since they went in there. They seem to have rejuvenated the place a bit. They're getting a tune out of certain players who. Maybe weren't maybe the previous manager wasn't getting so much of a tune out. I mean Cameron Angus who scored on Saturday, that's three goals in two games for him and he was somebody who previously wasn't really getting wasn't he actually playing too much, but he's come in and really sort of taken his chance in the last couple of games and kinda of probably epitomises the whole sort of wee turnaround Vale have had. And I think whether Grant and Graham want to take it on permanently or not, I don't know, but I think certainly the way they're going, I'd imagine there will be a, a conversation had where they probably get o- offered the chance to do it going forward. Locos, um, they've taken their Sean McIntosh yeah. had a couple of good saves in the first half, and I think Locos had the conditions first half. If they get a second goal or even a third. It's probably a totally different game, but as Dean Donaldson said afterwards, you've you can both boxes taking your chances is a difference, and, and Vale have done that when theirs came along. Yeah, we'll still have a cup final to come, of course, in a couple of weeks' time. Near County nil for Martin United two, the last one that went ahead at the weekend. Comfy for Martin, four for Martin by the sound of th- sounds of things. Uh, Julian Wade with the two goals. Your favourite player, Ryan. I'm not going to ask the question. I was going to ask about Team of the Year, Callum, but. I mean, Julian Wade, he's had a cracking season, has he not? He has, definitely. 24 goals now for the campaign after his brace on Saturday. You're hinting at <laughs> Team of the Year stuff. <laughs> I'm already having sleepless nights <laughs> thinking about trying to pick it. Right now, I think I've got about six strikers in. and two, A goalie, two centre-halves and six strikers, and then just I'll just slot in another <laughs> couple. But in all seriousness, uh, for, for Martin, they've done well there. Again sounded like conditions weren't you know ideal with the with the breeze on Saturday and for Martin have 
probably handled it a bit better than than Nairn over the piece. Thought Stephen McCoy was quite interesting. He felt Nairn maybe weren't clinical enough. Aaron Nicholson had an effort tipped on at the crossbar when it was only one nil. And again, games like that, it's maybe a turning happens, point. Yeah. What you were saying about Huntley and Banks a D and the difference between maybe top six and not that's maybe il- illustrated again a wee bit in that game if, if Nairn get back to 1-1 one, one, it's obviously different but very good win for, for Martin two clean sheets on the trot which I'm sure will, will please Stuart Anderson no doubt and they're still I mean looks like prob- probably finish fifth but you know they've had another maybe been unlucky at times with one or two things and injuries that have gone against them but they've had another good season and I'm sure they'll be looking to finish off strongly as well what also interests me from this game and it comes back to Huntley and Turriff as well is fight to finish 7th I mean Bro- Broder are still there on 53 points just now in that but yeah. with their games in hand I would expect them to get enough points to finish 6th and that leaves you Huntley, Nairn and Turriff Huntley and Nairn play each other at Christie Park this weekend La- last game for both of them Huntley are a point in front so you'd think if they, I mean, if they draw, they'd obviously be finish ahead on Nairn. If they were to win, probably gives them a good chance of finishing seventh. But Turriff have Lossie, Forrest and Barora still to play. They've the three games all away from home. But if Turriff could win all three of those games, they would finish seventh. Nairn, obviously, if they win, would then be you know in the box seat. So I, I know that might be talk a lot about the top of the table, but for three sides. That's three sides there in Huntley, Turriff and Nairn who have all made improvements again this season and I think that's quite a, for the last couple of weeks, that's quite a lot, sort of interesting little race to watch just to see who can sort of be closest to the top six. It's going to be a slightly, before we look at the Highland League table as it is now, it's going to be a slightly peculiar week because <laughs> games postponed at the weekend as touched upon earlier, there's had to be a shake-up of the fixture schedule again because the title race and the need to declare a champion Bucky Thistle are having to play Keith this evening before playing again on Wednesday tonight as well we're also going to have Rothis against Forest Mechanics well, it's just it's unfortunate just run out of days and like I think with the weather at the end of last week you were sort of feeding the worst in terms of Saturday and it's like Bucky now they play Monday, Wednesday Saturday this week and the same again next week because 20th of April champion needs to be declared by it's not ideal but there's it's like all, all other options seem to have run yeah. out now it is a pity that we're going to see a, a title race determined this way because obviously it's Keith playing tonight and then I think they've got Bucky eh, sorry breaking on Wednesday so it's to play two title challengers in the space of 48 hours from their point of view is going to be hard as well mm-hmm. yeah but the one upside of it is you'll be able to watch Keith Bucky uh, with us on Highland League Weekly Extra, and we'll also have a, a game on on Wednesday night as well. So you'll get you'll get more highlights at least. Yeah. So just remember that because I won't be telling you in the outro now. <laughs> it, so bear that in mind. Okay, let's have a look then at the Breeding Highland League standings as they are now. <laughs> 